Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here with us. I am Horace Mitchell, and it has been my privilege and honor to serve our community as president of CSU Bakersfield over the last 14 years. I extend to each of you a personal welcome, as well as a welcome on behalf of the university's distinguished faculty, dedicated staff, and great students, including especially the faculty and staff of the Kegley Institute of Ethics. Several years ago, it was my pleasure to present to the Institute a President's Award for 25 years of excellence in promoting a more just and ethical world through teaching, faculty research, lecture series, and community service. And I think it's probably close to the time to present another award to the Institute. Now, most of you probably know that I will be retiring at the end of this academic year. And so I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce my successor, who, who will become the president of CSU Bakersfield on July 1st. She is currently the provost and vice president for academic affairs at Fresno State University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lynette Zelensky. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, one aspect of the university's vision is to strengthen our community engagement. The Kegley Institute of Ethics epi epitomizes that goal by enhancing the quality of community discourse on ethical issues. The institute brings to the campus and community excellent scholars and other outstanding speakers to address significant ethical issues of our time. Tonight's topic is certainly one of those significant issues. Tonight, the Institute presents its 32nd annual Charles W. Keckley Memorial Lecture entitled Ethical Dilemmas in Democratic Education, featuring our guest speaker, Dr. Mira Levinson, Professor of Education at Harvard University. Welcome, Dr. Levinson, uh, and thank you for being with us to share your reflections, thoughts, and insights this evening. And Dr. Levinson will be introduced formally uh, shortly. We extend our thanks to all of the Kegley Institute of Ethics sponsors, and a special thanks to our major sponsors, Chevron, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Adventist Health, Bakersfield, Kaiser Permanente, and the Kegley family. We appreciate greatly your ongoing support. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the director of the Kegley Institute of Ethics, Dr. Michael Burroughs. Hello, everyone. It's good. It's good to see you. So uh, thank you, President Mitchell, for your introduction and for your great support of this event over, over the many years. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. And also thank you to uh, incoming President Zelezny for being with us tonight and joining us for dinner. It's greatly appreciated as well. So um, I want to extend another thank you to, to all of you for uh, joining together with us on this Monday evening for this important conversation and this important event. The Institute, the Kegley Institute of Ethics, um, is both committed to advancing ethics, education, and research on our campus, but also building programs collaboratively with our community, students, faculty, staff, community members. And so it means a tremendous, to me, a tremendous amount to me and our staff for all of you to be here tonight um, and to take your time to be with us, so thank you. And I want to reiterate our support for, again, our, our event sponsors, uh, the Kegley family, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Kaiser Permanente, and Adventist Health Bakersfield, and Chevron. Uh, your support is vital in helping us to uh, present events like this one. So to set a bit of context before I introduce our speaker tonight, 
So the Kegley Memorial Lecture has long been an important event for our campus and community. As President Mitchell uh, mentioned, this is the 32nd annual Kegley Memorial Lecture. And this is founded in honor of Dr. Charles Kegley. So Charles Kegley was the founder of the CSUB Philosophy and Religious Studies Department, as well as one of the co-founders of the Kegley Institute of Ethics. And he's also a recent inductee into the CSUB Faculty Hall of Fame. Dr. Kegley saw ethics and philosophy as engaged practices, practices that focus on real problems and open questions in our communities. To that end, this lecture series has featured talks from public figures and leading specialists on poverty, immigration, human rights, climate change, healthcare, race, and more, with speakers ranging from Daniel Ellsberg and Cornell West to Tracy Martin, Jocelyn Elders, Paul Rusas Beguina, and many others. I'm happy to note that our lecture tonight, which features Dr. Mira Levinson, will continue the great traditions of this series. Dr. Levinson's training includes degrees from Yale University and the University of Oxford, as well as eight years as a classroom teacher in Boston and Atlanta public schools. Her research focuses on civic and multicultural education and educational ethics, and she has published a wealth of articles and six books in these areas, including the multi-award winning No Citizen Left Behind and Dilemmas of Educational Ethics. Now please note that we have a book table in the lobby with both of those titles on sale. Uh, and actually directly following her lecture, uh, Dr. Levinson will uh, be at the table and is, uh, will be signing books for those interested if you wanna hang out for a while afterwards. I also wanna mention that our library um, on campus has ordered these titles as well and has them on display and they're available for checkout as well. So Dr. Levinson's talk tonight is titled Ethical Dilemmas in Democratic Education and will focus on pressing issues in education and civic life. These are issues that perhaps you've encountered firsthand as an educator, that you have discussed with your children or peers, or that you have seen in the media on a regular basis. These are things like the student-led marches for our lives, statewide teacher strikes, sanctuary school debates, lawsuits over bathroom access for transgender students, and battles over school curricula. Tonight, Dr. Levinson will, in essence, discuss schools' roles in this political moment that we all face, and approaches to ethical dilemmas that lie at the very heart of a democratic society such as ours. I want to mention, too, that for those educators in the room, particularly this year, K through four educators, um, the Kegley Institute of Ethics is hosting a three-day summer institute. The information, relevant details are here. The SEED Summer Institute, which will be focusing on ways to introduce ethics, civic education, and social emotional learning into uh, our classrooms. Um, that will also include a $1,000 stipend for participating educators. So if you're interested, the application is on the Kegley website, and we'd love to have you and love to talk with you about it. With that being said, um, I'd like you to join me in please welcoming to the stage Dr. Mira Levinson. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. Um, and uh, it's a real honor. I really want to thank uh, Michael Burroughs uh, and the Kegley Institute for Ethics for inviting me uh, and organizing my trip here. I want to thank all of you for attending. And I'm particularly honored, I realize, I think, are we OK using this mic because this thing is falling off? We're good? I can't hear. But I'm going to assume so. Great. Um, sorry. And I'm particularly honored by the presidents of President Mitchell, incoming President Zelezny, Pr Provost Zorn, Vice Provost Schechter, and Dr. Jackie Kegley. It's a true honor um, to be here uh, with um, them and you in this audience. And uh, we were talking at dinner about whether or not I knew the history of the lecture. And I said, no, I don't think so. And then when uh, we were talking about it, I said, oh, right, yes, I did. And I intentionally did not remind myself of who some of the previous speakers were in the last couple of months as I was working on it. Uh, so I sort of wish I had <laughs> didn't know again. Um, but it's, it's really a true honor to be here. So um, as Michael said, what I want to talk about uh, this evening is ethical dilemmas in democracy democratic education. In particular, I want to talk about uh, the tensions that educators face in teaching, between uh, teaching 
in democracy and teaching for democracy, especially at a time of hyper-partisanship and political upheaval. I'm gonna set up the challenges through presenting a case study of a school that's facing multiple dilemmas of democratic education. Um, after presenting the case, I'll pull out some of the central tensions and I'll talk about how and why they present essential, but also, I think, unfortunately, irresolvable challenges. Ones that we should be engaged in discussing with one another, but that can rarely then actually be answered and set aside. Uh, and because these tensions are baked into our democracy, I'm gonna argue next, a discussion about these cases can itself serve as an essential component of democratic education and engagement. So in other words, I'll, I'm gonna suggest that we should use cases like these, like the one I'm going to present tonight, um, in faculty meetings, in PTA meetings, school board meetings, teacher preparation courses, professional development sessions for school leaders, and so forth, in order to prompt collective deliberation about ethical dilemmas in democratic education. So the cases serve not only to illuminate essential tensions in democratic education, tensions I'm going to say, unfortunately, we have no way of overcoming, that in some ways we just have to live with, but then also these cases serve to facilitate a, a equally essential democratic engagement with one another about the aims, policies, and practices of democratic education. Finally, if I have time, I'm going to talk about how these tools fit into a larger vision of educational ethics as a developing field for policy practice and research. And it sort of depends on how quickly I speak and how much I go off on tangents as to whether or not we'll get there. But I'll, I'm telling you that now in case I don't get there and then you want to bring it up in the Q&A. So let me start with uh, the case, which I should note is a fictionalized uh, composite of real life events and challenges that have arisen in a number of schools. And I wanna thank uh, two former students of mine, Sarah Kaleha and Tony Kalkenis, uh, who researched and then co-authored this case uh, with me. So here's the case. It, um, it takes place at Jersey City K-8 uh, school. Uh, in the school culture committee, which has a monthly meeting that's been set up um, to, uh, it's been initiated to address a recent surge in divisive language among students. And the meeting includes, you'll hear parents, uh, school leadership, teachers, uh, and it, Principal Winters uh, kicks it off by asking about a specific incident, which was one of the incidents that had actually started uh, the school culture committee meeting every month. Um, so there's this girl, Danielle, uh, whose family supports, uh, supported Donald Trump during the election. She had been vocal about uh, supporting Donald Trump, and she, after the election, was then blamed by some of her friends for Donald Trump's win. She's a fourth grader. Uh, and uh, they got upset with her about it. And so there was a sort of rift. And so uh, Principal Win Winters asked, are Danielle's friends still ostracizing her because of her family's support for Trump? And Rob Lewis is the school's guidance counselor, and so he's the one who's then uh, trying to coordinate helping them get back together, and he says, well, the girls are talking honestly to one another during our fourth grade lunches, but it's going to take more time and work for their friendships to be repaired. Teresa, in particular, still can't forgive Danielle for making that comment about, quote, criminal illegals, given what she knows about Teresa's cousin. And Danielle is just so hurt that her friends are holding her political views against her. They're all taking these statements very personally. It's hard not to take them personally. This is Gregory Timms, the seventh grade father. Um, white students are the minority at this school, but they're treated like they're the unjustly privileged majority. My son Colin also has kids in his class who won't work with him because he supports Trump. He told me last night that he wishes he could switch schools. Well, we love Colin. We hope he won't leave JCK8, said Susie, Colin's humanities teacher. I think the problem is that many of Trump's statements are so emotionally damaging to many of our students. They lack the coping strategies to depersonalize them. Then Madison, the mother of a first grade student, jumps in. Right, how are kids supposed to react when they hear their classmates insinuating they don't even belong in this country? I believe in zero tolerance for bullying. Our kids are having to set the boundaries with their friends because the school isn't doing it for them. 
Principal Winters, you'll see, is a little unsure of herself, so she jumps in. I agree that our committee needs to set these boundaries more clearly, but I worry about characterizing these disputes automatically as bullying. So Jersey City is in uh, New Jersey, and New Jersey has a state law that mandates, uh, just as with, um, say, child abuse, uh, and with other, that bullying and harassment get automatically reported to the state. So by state law, we are mandated reporters for all incidents of bullying and harassment, but we shouldn't be reporting and punishing Danielle or Teresa or Colin's classmates. We should be teaching them how to work together and get along. You faced a version of this teachable moment question in your class last week, didn't you? Rob, the guidance counselor, prompts Elena Morales, who's a veteran first grade teacher. Yes, Elena eagerly began her story. It was choice time, and a small group of boys began building a wall with blocks that spanned the width of the classroom. At first, I thought nothing of it, but then they started chanting, build the wall, build the wall. I could see that some of my students were feeling uncomfortable, and I immediately called, time out. Normally, I don't interfere with the children's play. They need the freedom to explore, problem solve, and negotiate differences on their own. But this time, something felt different. I asked the boys, what are you boys working on, hmm? And they said, we're building the wall to keep the Mexicans out. They were so excited and proud of their work. At first, I was really angry and I had to take some deep breaths. And then I thought, maybe I'd just redirect them to a different activity. Say, bring out the paints instead. Because after all, they don't know the hate behind what they're saying. But then I felt like, you know what? I'm their teacher. It's my responsibility to educate them and help them understand that we should embrace others rather than fear them. So I posed the question to the class. Why do some people want to keep other people out? The kids had so many interesting responses. One child said, because sometimes you just want to be alone or with your best friends, and so you have to say no to some people. Another child said, because you have to stay safe, and you don't know if strangers could be dangerous. One of the boys building the wall with the block said, because Mexicans will take our jobs. So I turned to that boy, and I asked him, what is your job? <laughs> he looked at me with wide eyes and shrugged his shoulders. So I said to my class, your job, boys and girls, is to come to school to learn. And while you are at school, your job is to be kind, to be caring, and to be respectful so that everyone has a safe learning space. Do you think anyone can stop you from being kind, caring, and respectful? And they all said, no! So I said, then nobody can take your job. Madison broke the silence that followed. Thank you, Miss Morales. You are teaching our children what really counts in life, to be kind to each other and to think about their actions. You didn't shame the boys or talk about politics. You just guided them toward their better selves. I think that this is the kind of teaching that all families value at JCK8. Yes, exclaimed Susie, the seventh grade humanities teacher. You handled that amazingly. I would have gotten much more political, but you didn't even need to talk about the issue to correct the thought process behind the behavior. I can learn a lot from your example. Rob, the guidance counselor, then interjected. I think it's important to note that first graders have different developmental needs than seventh graders, Susie. While Elena's response may have been just right for her students, a more nuanced and critical response would be appropriate for older children and young adults. Gregory, Colin's father, then spoke up. His voice was tense. Don't any of you see what is wrong here? Those boys were play acting the policies of the President of the United States and their teacher, a public employee no less, leveraged her personal, moral, and political reasoning to stop them. That was a partisan move through and through. The boys were creatively engineering a wall, and they were drawing on their knowledge of current events in the process. That should have been celebrated by the teacher. But instead, their entire innovation was discouraged. If you wanted to make it a teachable moment, Ms. Morales, you could have taken the time to explain to them the difference between legal and illegal immigration. That would have been a good lesson. 
Gregory has a point, Principal Winters affirmed. You can tell that this was written by three teachers who do not have a lot of experience in, uh, with really, really high quality school leaders. Um, so all of us had stories of many school principals who were quite wishy-washy. We can't censor student play or creativity just because it happens to disagree with our politics. School needs to be a neutral space, a politics-free zone. But school can't be a politics-free zone, Rob countered. What happened in Elena's classroom and with Danielle a few months ago, that shows us that politics will enter the school whether we plan for it or not. That's why we set up this committee, right? Susie agreed. The purpose of school is to prepare students to be citizens in a democracy. How can we prepare future citizens if we cannot talk about politics? We need to lean into these conversations, not back away. If we're going to lean in to politics, Gregory interjected, let's have our kids study the First Amendment. In this country, offensive speech is protected. If you don't like what someone is saying, you have the right to ignore it. You can't censor something just because it doesn't agree with you. That's a freedom we fight for all around the world. But these are kids in school, Madison protested. Adults can walk away from offensive statements or people, but our children can't go anywhere. You said yourself that Colin wanted to switch schools, but can't. I volunteered for this committee for a similar reason. I want Marquise to have a more positive experience here than I did as a student when I had to endure all sorts of racist nonsense. We appreciate your commitment, Madison, Principal Winters affirmed, and yours too, Gregory. Madison is right. We can't ignore statements and incidents that create a hostile learning environment and inhibit students' learning, especially since attendance is mandatory. Exactly, Elena interjected. Free speech doesn't mean that schools shouldn't teach children how to be kind to and inclusive of one another. I'm all for teaching kindness. Just don't confuse kindness with political ideology, Gregory responded. Democrats don't have a monopoly on good character. Not to mention that your inclusiveness seems to stop where conservative perspectives begin. Those Shepherd Ferry posters in the humanities hallway showing everyone except a white male as part of we the people, they're obviously anti-Trump. Colin notices that his views and people that hold them aren't welcome. I hardly think that posters fe featuring women of color saying things like we the people protect each other and we the people defend dignity are inappropriate, Susie protested. They're simply inclusive. The posters show all students that we value them as people and that everyone's needs and rights are respected. Gregory was skeptical. Would you be equally happy to put up a poster of a white man standing up for Second Amendment rights? Before Susie could respond, Rob intervened. These are great conversations, but not ones we can resolve in the few minutes we have left tonight. I'm wondering where we stand more generally. Do we have any principles or policies we can agree will improve school culture while respecting student diversity, including political diversity? Let me give you a minute to process what you've heard. And then I'm going to invite you to turn to the person next to you and discuss just for a couple minutes, I promise. Uh, what dilemmas do you see as being significant in this case? So take a minute to think, and then I'll cue you in to turn and talk. OK, go ahead and turn and talk, since people are already starting.
Okay, wrap up whatever you're saying. Great, bring it to a close. Ah, this is the thing I love about college campuses as opposed to eighth grade classrooms. Uh, <laughs> um, great, so as I hinted at the beginning of my talk, I see many of the dilemmas in this case as arising from the challenge of teaching for democracy in a democracy. And let me say that I am not now intending to give you the answer to what the dilemma or the dilemmas are in the case. Uh, what I'm about to say to you is not meant to uh, you know, overrule whatever you said to each other. It's just because we are in a large auditorium that I'm not going to invite you to um, you know, say things to me. So I'm gonna give you one take on this case, but there are a bunch of other takes, I think, uh, that I know one can take on the case as well. Um, so, but tonight what I'm going to focus on is the tension between, in this case between teaching for democracy and teaching in a democracy. So it seems to me that everyone um, on the school culture committee seems to agree that Jersey City K-8 through school should be teaching students civic norms and dispositions. And I think that they agree that they should uh, be taught to embrace ideals uh, such as democratic e equality and inclusion, such as equal rights, and to enact these ideals by interacting with one another as democratic equals. That's what I mean by teaching for democracy, preparing students to take on civic roles and responsibilities as they grow into adults. But what these norms mean in practice how they are best enacted, and what additional civic norms, say such as freedom of expression and other civil liberties, deserve similar protections, are all deeply disputed, precisely because these are contested in contemporary democratic politics. So that's what I mean by teaching in democracy that adults disagree with one another about what the school should be teaching and how, and obviously students do as well. So let me break this down a bit and start with the um, idea of where the dilemma lies with respect to teaching for democracy. So to start with, I think that the members of the school culture committee disagree about the very conditions of democratic civic engagement. For example, where should the line fall between free speech and harassment or bullying in an elementary and middle school? I don't think that they know, or at least they certainly don't have a common answer to this question. Marquise's mom, Madison, seems to believe that language that suggests that certain kinds of people are unwelcome is prima facie uh, evidence of harassment or bullying. She's clearly upset over the first graders who reported that they were building a wall to keep the Mexicans out. And she sympathizes with Teresa's anger at Danielle for using the language of criminal illegals. At the same time, she does not seem particularly sympathetic to Danielle or Colin, both of whom clearly now themselves feel unwelcome at Jersey City K through eight. Colin feels so excluded that he wishes he could change schools. Madison may have principled reasons for distinguishing between Danielle and Colin on the one hand and say Teresa on the other, namely Teresa's racially minoritized status. She explains, Madison explains, that she joined the committee to combat what she called racial nonsense. From her perspective, language that demeans and excludes members of historically marginalized groups, and that echoes ideas expressed by those in power up to and including the President of the United States, may have an entirely different moral and political valence than a minoritized child saying to a white child, I don't want to be your friend anymore or I don't want to work with you. The latter is interpersonally hurtful, Madison might argue, but not harassing or bullying given the power differentials. From this perspective, in fact, the guidance counselor, Rob Lewis, might even be wrong to be trying to encourage Teresa and the other girls to resurrect their friendship with Danielle. As I'll discuss in more detail near the end of my talk, uh, we've made a longer version of this case available on a website that I have, uh, justiceinschools.org. 
And we've also invited philosophers, researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to respond to the case for a book about ethical dilemmas of democratic education that we're releasing next year with Harvard Education Press. And for that book, which is still in preparation, um, uh, but we've gotten some of the commentaries back. Uh, philosopher Maisha Cherry wrote a really fascinating commentary about the relationship between Teresa and Danielle, one that I had frankly not focused on before reading her essay. Um, and so that's one thing, again, I may talk about later, or I'm happy to discuss in the Q&A, the way w in which if you have a particularly contextually rich uh, case study, People can respond to things in the case study and you can have conversations that even you as the author of the case study had no intention of prompting and hadn't actually noticed. Um, and so um, Professor Cherry brings this out in her commentary. So she raises two concerns about how guidance counselor Lewis is working with the girls. First, she points out that Teresa should not be expected to forgive Danielle unconditionally which is what she feels is happening, and especially the longer version of the case. She explains, quote, if Teresa unconditionally forgives Danielle, it is not clear how this will repair important elements of the girl's friendship. Danielle and Teresa will still disagree on the nature of the wrongdoing. Danielle may continue to hurt Teresa or others with expressions of her political beliefs. Teresa may not be able to trust Danielle with knowledge of her family and beliefs, thus limiting their, their depth of their relationship, unquote. And second, Professor Cherry claims, friendship is what she calls an elective relationship. One does not need to have or to give either generalizable reasons for making a friend or cutting off a friendship, or even defensible reasons for why one forms a friendship and breaks it off. Now, I should note, this doesn't quite square with how we teach social relationships in schools normally. So here I think about uh, famed kindergarten teacher Vivian Paley, and probably one of her most famous books uh, is a book called You Can't Say You Can't Play. In that book, she offers robust and I would say quite compelling reasons for why she requires children to include one another on the playground and in the classroom. So I don't mean to suggest, and at least not without further argument, which I'm not going to take the time to provide here, that Professor Cherry's analysis is totally right, all things considered. As Madison herself points out, we impose much greater constraints on students' behaviors and speech in schools than we do in the broader public square, in part because students are forced to attend school. To the extent that schools are fundamentally non-elective spaces, it may be inaccurate to view any relationship within school, even interpersonal friendship, as truly elective. So part of educating students for democracy is perhaps paradoxically forcing them to practice and enact democratically egalitarian relationships with one another, whether or not they wish to. Speaking of forcing relationships, Danielle and Teresa are not the only students who are suffering the rupture and teacher-guided attempted restoration of their relationship. So Colin is also suffering, right? And his claim to inclusion, I think, seems much clearer even than Danielle's claim, because Danielle's claim is about restoring a friendship, whereas Colin's claim is about being excluded from cooperative working groups. So he deserves to work with other students, and his political viewpoints should presumably not be grounds to exclude him from group work, and certainly not from academic learning. But it's worth considering here whether his classmates should be forced to work with him because this is what a democratic civic education requires, or if they should be forced to work with him for more instrumental reasons related to workplace preparation. So partly, I think, Collins should be included in cooperative learning groups so that he has the full opportunity to learn. This seems like a matter of distributive justice. So if we think that learning is aided through working cooperatively with others in the classroom, then Colin deserves also to have access to those pedagogies in order to learn. Um, I'll note as an aside, though, that it may depend on how hateful or disturbing Colin's comments are as to whether or not his classmates should be used as instruments of Colin's learning, especially if he says sufficiently hateful things that it, uh, in fact, impedes their own learning uh, when they are working with him. 
But separate from issues of distributive justice as to why Collins should be, uh, why sort of Collins classmates should be forced to include him equally as a member of the group in these cooperative group situations. It may also be important for Collins classmates to learn to work with him because doing so will help them develop the skills and dispositions to work with people they don't like, right? We all, frankly, have to work with people whose views we find distasteful or who say things that we really get repelled by in some way, right? And it's important as a matter of helping young people grow up and eventually enter the workforce for seventh graders to learn this and to learn how to persevere with others despite their mutual dislike. So that's another reason, I think, to force Collins' classmates to include him. But it's note that it's not necessarily a civic justification for ending Collins' exclusion. Furthermore, I would imagine that Collins' father, Gregory, would be quite upset if Principal Winters offered workforce development as the grounds for directing Susie and the other seventh grade teachers to ensure that Colin was fully included in the classroom in the future. In his eyes, I think, the school is perpetrating a civic wrong against Colin by treating his political viewpoints as worthy of condemnation. Even more to the point, he argues that Elena wrongs the first graders who are building the block wall when she shames them for their play, rather than celebrating their own civic knowledge and engagement. So extending Gregory's point a bit, we might ask whether political speech should ever count as bullying, and if so, why? And I should say this is something that I have really wrestled with um, since my first uh, years as an eighth grade teacher. Um, one of the incidents that I wrote about in one of my books, No Citizen Left Behind, was about an Orthodox Jewish student I had, which was very unusual. This was a, a school in Boston that um, did not have many white students, let alone uh, any Orthodox Jewish students. And this was in 2006, uh, right after the Massachusetts Supreme Court had um, ruled that according to the Massachusetts Constitution, uh, same-sex marriage uh, was a constitutional requirement in Massachusetts. And so there was a group of people who were trying to organize a ballot initiative in order to actually then get a constitutional amendment to declare that marriage was uh, between one man and one woman. And this student who I call Jonah in the book wanted to do his citizenship project. I was teaching eighth grade civics at the time. Uh, and, and he wanted to do his citizenship project on, uh, against same-sex marriage, um, actually on Talmudic grounds. Um, and one, and it was actually my student teacher who was teaching his class, and so she was the one who had to decide what to do about this, and, she, and the poor woman, she had this political theorist as a mentor teacher, and so I subjected her to a lot of conversations about roles and public reason, and we had all sorts of discussions about this. Um, my uh, student teacher thought that absolutely Jonah should not be allowed to do this project. Uh, the school that we were teaching in, uh, in Boston, there were about 750 kids in the school. Uh, not a single student was out at that point. There was, we did not have any um, openly gay or lesbian, or you know, let alone transgender uh, or um, you know, student in the school, nor as far as we were aware, was there, were there any parents who were out? So this was, by definition, given that there were 750 kids and at least as many parents, grandparents, et cetera, involved, a deeply homophobic school. Now, it was pretty clear to us that in Jonah's classroom, there were a few students who were at the very least questioning uh, and in fact, who came out uh, once they went off to the arts high school in the city a couple years later. Uh, and we were really concerned about what the effect would be on them of having in this already deeply homophobic space a student presenting his citizenship project uh, on why um, same-sex marriage was sinful. Uh, on the other hand, as I pointed out to her, we were perfectly fine having students do work uh, opposing the war in Iraq, despite the fact that we knew that we had um, students whose brothers, uh, and in one case a sister, were fighting in Iraq, uh, and in some cases voluntarily, you know, enthusiastically fighting in Iraq as opposed to having been deployed there against their better judgment. Um, and 
nowadays, I would say um, that there are, you know, you can think of equally many cases. We, we have another case for this book um, on these civic ethical dilemmas that addresses transgender bathroom. Um, uh, a debate in a 10th grade social studies team that's trying to decide whether or not to have a debate about whether or not um, transgender students should be allowed to use the bathroom of the gender with which they identify as opposed to their birth gender. Um, and it's really interesting to think about, you know, what is the valence of that if you're having that debate in Massachusetts, which is comparatively um, transgender friendly, versus, say, having it in North Carolina or Texas, where um, you know, state legislatures have taken up this, uh, as, and uh, there have been pushes, in fact, to uh, forbid uh, even districts from having pol adopting policies that within the district allow uh, transgender students to use the bathroom with, with the agenda, with, that accord with the gender with which they identify. And so I think it's a really hard question, right? It, to me, I actually was in favor of letting Jonah do his citizenship project um, because it was a matter in the public eye. It was being openly debated. And it seemed to me as if we, if we were preparing students for citizenship uh, and this was a matter of public debate, then they needed to engage with that. Uh, and it's not as if, you know, if we didn't have it in the classroom, they weren't going to encounter it out of the classroom, right? And so why not bring it into the classroom? I more or less have similar feelings also about, say, uh, discussing transgender bathroom rights and other things. My student teacher, on the other hand, uh, was pretty firmly against it um, because as I did, she viewed this as a matter of human rights. Um, so she and I agreed that we thought that same-sex marriage rights were a matter of human rights. Uh, and yet, I was more willing to allow um, Jonah to do a project that sort of violated my understanding of human rights. She was not, uh, which was understandable to me uh, as well. Because if you go into other directions, say if you push me on whether or not, say, a student should have been able to do a project on uh, waterboarding, which was also still a live issue in 2006, I don't know where I would have ended up. And so then there's a question about, was this some weakness in my actual commitment to human rights? Or did I have some principled stand about the distinction between those two things? So I think there's this question about whether political speech should count as bullying and or whether the school is complicit in bullying in allowing certain political speech into the classroom or disallowing political speech from the classroom. And I'm going to come back to that. All right. Um, one of the things that I'll note is that th these disagreements are exacerbated, I think, by different views about children's own place in schools and in society. Do we see them as vulnerable beings in need of protection? Or do we see them as autonomous agents in development? And clearly, in some way, right, we have to see them as both. Presumably, you know, in kindergarten or go as young as you want to go, they are vulnerable beings basically in need of protection, who should also be allowed certain forms of autonomous expression, but we pro probably prioritize protection above, say, political autonomy. I would hope by the time they get into the later years of high school, we have reversed that, in part because they are out in the world and they are going to go further out into the world and they're not going to have our protection and so we better figure out how to help them develop their capacities and their resilience as autonomous beings. But part of, I think, what we see happening here among Elena and Susie and Rob and Gregory, and to some extent Principal Whit Winters as she, uh, you know, namby-pamby goes back and forth, is this uh, tension and this debate. And I think that this is an essential question in educational ethics overall, not just about civic education and, and the ethics of democratic education, but when we think about educational ethics more broadly, to what extent should schools protect students from versus prepare them for the broader world? 
And that, in some ways, is this essential tension in educational ethics between our goal of creating schools as places that envision a better world than we live in today. Right? Schools are always aspirational places. We're always trying to develop people to be better than we are, and hence to create a society that is better than we. But at the same time, we have the obligation in schools to prepare students to succeed in the world that it, as it exists. Right? Because if we don't do that, then we have also failed children, unless that new, better world magically pops into existence the moment that they graduate, and that's probably not going to happen. Right? So this essential tension, I think, is true in all sorts of places, and it's true, I think, especially in civic education. All right. So far, I've been dissecting this case as being one about educating for democracy. What kinds of norms, speech, and other behavior should we be teaching children are appropriate in a democratic polity, and how should we teach these? Okay, that's all educating for democracy, this sort of aspirational thing. Now I want to turn to the second key challenge for the Jersey City School Culture Committee, and obviously I think for ourselves, because otherwise I wouldn't be focusing on uh, JCK8, which is to determine what constitutes appropriate education within a democracy, given how deeply the JCC School Culture Committee and we disagree with one another over what values even count as common foundational civic norms versus what values are being seen as merely or let alone dangerously partisan. Again, I think that Gregory gives the most robust account of how the norms that Elena and Susie see as being shared by all, he gives this account of them as being partisan positions, or in the case of the Shepherd Ferry uh, posters, as being partisan symbols in disguise. As he points out, the language of the posters may seem perfectly innocuous, but their partisan valence becomes clear in context. When I was in Pennsylvania last summer uh, working with district superintendents, one of them raised a really interesting similar case that he was wrestling with. So after President Trump was elected, yard signs had sprung up in part of the city. This was a pretty purple district. Um, so yard signs had sprung up in the sort of liberal side of the uh, district saying, hate has no home here, love lives here. A few teachers had posted those signs in their classrooms as well, with no apparent ill effects. A few weeks later, however, in a different neighborhood of, of town, um, a new si set of signs started appearing in these other yards. And those signs read, love for God, love for country, love for constitution. This district happened to be a fairly religious area, so it's unlikely that the hate has no home here houses were particularly ungodly, let alone atheist. Presumably, many of the residents who had put up these signs also actually viewed themselves, particularly at this time after President Trump was elected, as patriotic defenders of the country and of what they believed the Constitution stood for. Nevertheless, it was clear how the love asserted by the second set of signs, love for God, love for country, love for constitution, was intended to be read in contrast to the love provide, uh, promised by the first set, love lives here. And soon afterwards, some students started complaining to the school principal about the anti-hate signs in the teacher's classrooms the ones that had initially been up with no you know, real response. And then the superintendent had to decide whether to tell the teachers to remove them. And if so, on what grounds does he tell teachers to remove signs that say, hate has no home here, love lives here? I think, I'm, I, I don't know what he ended up doing. We talked about it, and then I went back to Boston, and <laughs> I, I don't know what happened in his district. Um, I, I'm going to give one more example, though, uh, because I think that it forces us to wrestle on the other side. I think Black Lives Matter, clearly, is a similarly contested phrase. It's one that has radically different valences, depending on one's political position, including whether it is seen as being partisan as, at all. Right. So um, some of you may know, because it's close to here, um, 
Uh, there's a longtime substitute teacher, David Roberts, uh, who had been uh, subbing at Clovis West High School uh, here in California. Um, and he wore a Black Lives Matter pin at school on election day 2016. So uh, Clovis West High School has about a 5% African American population, pretty small. Um, so Clovis has a clear policy that prohibits employees from engaging in political activities during the workday, which Roberts was judged to be uh, clearly violating. I should say that he had been a long-term sub there for about 25 or 30 years. He was in his 70s um, uh, and a sort of a fixture at the school. Uh, and so he responded to being fired with surprise and perplexity, maintaining, quote, a pin that reads Black Lives Matter is not a political button. It's a peaceful request to end this violence. It's not a protest. It's not intended to be anti-police and does not imply that black lives matter more than other lives. It simply says they matter too. Now, Robert's interpretation of Black Lives Matter as apolitical may seem quirky or even disingenuous, given that Black Lives Matter's own guiding principles, if you look them up on the web, describe BLM as, quote, an ideological and political intervention in a world where black lives are systematically and intentionally targeted for demise, unquote. But at the same time, Roberts perhaps understandably viewed his button as a way to support students of color on what everybody recognized would be an emotionally trying day. That's why I was doing it, to show solidarity to the kids, Roberts explained to the Fresno Bee. They really appreciated it. Roberts also questioned the district's commitment to political neutrality. Clovis Unified claims you have to be neutral, but they're not neutral. There's a set of beliefs you're expected to have there. And quite clearly, those set of beliefs were not supposed to include a commitment to the Black Lives Matter movement. So I want to note, these challenges right, are not new. I've already given you an example, say, from 2006 from my classroom. Uh, but these, cla these challenges go back and back and back. So Diana Hess uh, wrote in her book, Controversy in the Classroom, in 2009, about the challenge of what she calls teaching in the tip. So when a controversial issue is in the tip, it's moving from being widely viewed as being open um, to being widely viewed as settled, or vice versa. But when it's in the tip, people disagree about whether it actually is an open, and hence controversial issue, or whether it's a settled issue. So for example, same-sex marriage in Massachusetts in 2006, in some ways, my student teacher viewed as a settled issue, and I viewed as an unfortunately open issue. It wasn't open to me, but I viewed it as open within the polity as a whole, and she basically viewed it as settled. Um, so teaching in the tip is really challenging because there are two separate levels of contestation. One is over the substance of the controversy, right? So Jonah and I may have agreed that it was an open controversy, but we were on opposite sides, right? But then the other dispute is over whether the issue should be treated as reasonably contestable at all. And that's a really different kind of disagreement, right? But they both go together when you're teaching in the tip. I think that these, so although I think there's a long, long history of this, and uh, Professor Hess writes about actually the Japanese internment camps and Korematsu, um, where she said when she was growing up uh, as a white kid in the 1950s in the Midwest, basically uh, they were taught and, uh, that uh, the Japanese internment camps were an unfortunate but totally legitimate and justifiable uh, response to a threat from Japan and Japanese Americans during World War II. Then when she was a newbie teacher, I think in the early, early mid-1960s, late 1960s, she said that they were kind of edgy because they were tr treating it actually as a controversial issue. And then it was treated as a controversial issue through the 70s. I can say certainly by the time I was educated about Korematsu in the 1980s, it had gone through the tip and ended up as settled on the other side, right? And I think most of us would consider it outrageous if the Japanese internment camps were taught as anything other than a fundamental violation of Japanese American rights. Now, it is true that there are some 
like Stephen Miller, who are trying to nudge it back into the tip, right? Raising Korematsu, the Supreme Court has never disavowed it, and pointing out that that exists as a precedent as we think about uh, contemporary policy today. But for the moment, at least among mainstream Americans, let's say, it's still fairly settled, okay? But the fact that even Korematsu, which we might have thought was pretty, was firmly settled, is now perhaps being nudged back toward the tip, I think highlights the ways in which these controversies and controversies in the tip are currently heightened. So although there is this long tradition, I think we're in a period of particularly intense examples of teaching in the tip because we're in a period of fast norm shifting. So fast norm shifting can, can occur in response to significant legislation or judicial decisions, uh, compelling new scientific or social science evidence, large scale events or phenomena that people feel create a rupture with past understandings or beliefs. Think about say the 9-11 attacks in the United States, the influx of uh, refugees in contemporary Europe, or gun control activism by uh, students following a mass shooting. Uh, it can also occur thanks to powerful cultural productions or moments, beloved Olympic medalists coming out as transgender, the Me Too movement, or sudden shifts by elites that change or even reverse long-standing practices or values, or that shift one party in a way that changes partisan meetings, such as I would say President Trump is doing today, and as many conservatives argued that President Obama did when he ordered the executive branch to cease enforcing the Defense of Marriage Act and to give protections to undocumented residents through the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA. So fast norm shifts, I think, can be especially challenging to teachers who, apply, who aspire to be nonpartisan because how one appropriately interprets these uh, changes is itself contested, right? And itself is often a partisan interpretation. So when a civic norm changes quickly, for example, is that a sign that longstanding wrongs have finally been righted? or that fundamental values are being inappropriately diminished. And so I think here about the contrast between how liberals and conservatives read two Supreme Court decisions, Ober Obergfell on the one hand, which uh, declared that same-sex uh, marriages were um, constitutional and were required by the Constitution in all 50 states, and Citizens United, which declared that corporations had the status of people and that money had the status of speech. Right? So, Liberals tend to celebrate Obergfell and therefore treat, and then say, well, look, we had a Supreme Court decision. It's settled, right? There's no question anymore. Same-sex marriage is a fundamental uh, collective civic norm. But Citizens United, are you kidding me? Whereas conservatives are the reverse, right? They say, finally, Citizens United has recognized that there are many forms of speech and many agents who wish to speak. But Obergfell, that's something that we need to work to overturn, okay? So how we interpret, uh, so a teacher's decision, say, to treat a Supreme Court decision as the law of the land versus is still open to contestation, itself becomes a partisan decision, or at least is perceived as a partisan decision by those who disagree with the teacher's choice. And this is true for other presumptively dispositive phenomena, such as signed legislation, treaties, acts of war, right? So what I am wrestling with, and one of the reasons actually that my students and I wrote this case about uh, the Jersey City K-8, is is there any way for us in fact to declare in a way that is not itself inherently merely partisan that some norm shifts are wrong and other norm shifts are right and that even in the face of fast norm shifts, there may be a foundational and collective civic value that we still are right to teach, even if it is being moved into the tip. So I think about, say, teachers felt pretty confident five years ago saying that they were anti-racist teachers. They certainly felt 100% confident saying that racism has no place here in my classroom. Right. The language of anti-racist was a little sketchier because it's a little more connected to the left, but still they could basically say, I teach, I have an anti-racist classroom. Nowadays, that is perceived as being a partisan statement. 
And so then the question is, so what do we do about that? Just like what do we do about the Gregory's and the Madison's who are both placing pressure on schools, on the Susie's and Elena's and Rob's and Principal Winters for how to create a shared civic space that is in the democracy that we are in right now, but somehow educating for the democracy that we want for the future. I frankly don't think, like I've spent five years trying to figure out, is there a way to say, this is our way through, and this is how we can say, no, no, that's partisan, but this is like shared fundamental civic values. I don't think there's a way to do it. I think that the way we read the normative valence of these things inherently in some ways reflects our own political and partisan leanings. That's not to say that I don't think that defenses, good defenses can be given. I think you can give good defenses. I think that's something that political theorists do pretty well. But that's not something that I think will actually hold water with those who have a different um, set way of seeing the world than say I do. And so the last thing I want to say is therefore what I've done is turned back to these case studies not only as a way to illuminate these kinds of challenges, these civic ethical dilemmas, but then actually to be tools for conversation. I think that what I call normative case studies, so these are case studies of norms, of ethics, of values, not just of empirical facts in the world, right? That uh, we're trying to use these normative case studies to um, enable communities to have conversations with one another about the hard questions that we face together, ideally before the divisive issue comes up in one's own school or district or city or state, because at that point, it's too late, right? People are entrenched, they have their views, they start reading other people's statements through the lens of the fight that they're fighting. Whereas if we can come before that happens, before that rupture happens, and use a case study that feels real to people, right, where they say, oh yeah, I know Elena, <laughs> or I can tell you exactly who Susie is in my school, right? But that isn't something that they are personally implicated in, and then have conversations, I am hoping that we can create a culture of conversation with one another about our, our, our shared civic life and what our civic values and norms are. I would hope that these case studies can normalize disagreement as an appropriate part of education in and for a democracy, as opposed to treating disagreement itself as a breakdown, right? There are also breakdowns, but not every disagreement is a breakdown. And I'm hoping that these will, pro will provide tools for educators, policymakers, parents, and actually even students. So to my pleasure, there have been some eighth grade and high school students who have been using these cases in their class to address contentious issues before they tear apart a community and then develop habits and dispositions of ethical conversations with one another. Because that I think is what is so important is that we start having these conversations with one another now and come to trust one another as interlocutors so that then when something does come that may create a rupture, we have enough of a civic relationship with one another that we can talk to and listen to one another and try to find our way back to some shared values and some way of living together uh, as a community of democratic equals. Thank you. So I think we have time for questions. Yeah, the, uh, turn this on here. Okay. Yeah, you're good. So thank you, Dr. Levin for your fantastic talk. Sure. Um, we do have some time for Q and A. Um, so basically, I think I have is Muhammad in the room here. There's Muhammad. So Muhammad's gonna have one microphone over on this side, and my friend here, Reina. Reina. Yeah. Reina will have a microphone on this side, and so if you want to ask a question. Dr. Levinson will, will call on you, and then if you don't mind just waiting a second, we'll get the microphone to you so everybody can hear you nice and clear. Okay? Um, 
Thank you very much for your presentation. You talked a little bit about fast norm shifting. Yeah. And you talked about civic di discourse and the ability to respect other points of view. As we move towards a new norm that's all about name calling and disregarding people, how do you then um, adjust that in the classroom so that you can have an open dialogue, not one that's more contentious? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so um, we, so, so uh, one of my students, Dan Covino, and I uh, wrote a separate case uh, about this because uh, there's this problem that literally when students were, uh, so we wrote this case actually in the lead up up to um, the 2016 election, right, about a school that has this long tradition of holding mock elections and uh, like it's a really big thing, like the seniors, you know, like, you know, it's what they, they, they sort of, it's a tradition, they know it. But the problem is that just repeating the statements that, frankly, those on the right, Ted Cruz, Ben Carson, right, uh, Donald Trump were saying, themselves were inherent violations of the school's uh, anti-bullying codes, right? And how do you deal with that, right? What does that mean when the very language itself, if it were not spoken by a presidential candidate, would get a student uh, sometimes suspended, right? Um, and I, th so we wrote this case to try to address it. Frankly, like I went around and I was using it in professional development sessions with teachers and one of the most striking ones was, was that I was at a, a private school um, outside of Boston and we were talking about it and interestingly the school had a predominantly left-leaning student body and teacher body but had some prominent Republican uh, uh, families in it and two, so, so this is entirely stereotyping but I was shocked. So two of the social studies teachers who unsurprisingly were also athletic coaches because that's often what social studies teachers are but it was a, I think a football coach and a wrestling coach, they both started to cry and I was so taken aback because they said, like, I, I don't know how to stand up for the values that I believe in and teach my students to do the same and yet maintain a, you know, politically inclusive classroom, which they also realized was important. And so one of the rules that I have for these case studies that I write um, or that my students write and I, I I think I may have mentioned we have about 20 of them now posted on justiceinschools.org, is that I cannot know what the right answer is. And my students cannot know either. We can't, I refuse to let them or me write a case where the hidden agenda is to convince people about why they are wrong to think one thing, right? I'll do that in articles, right? Like I'm totally happy to tell people why they're wrong about something and what they should be doing instead. But I won't do that in a normative case study because it, and so I don't know, I get stuck. I, I actually have a question. Go for yeah. it, Mom. Yeah. Um, just to give a little insight on it, my, my mom has been in childcare for about 20 years, and she always taught using the uh, Reggio Emilia kind of approach, mm -hmm. where you know the students kind of lead. So from what I gather from your discussion is that one of the, the forefronts of, I would say, lecturing is not so much teaching topics, but teaching thought process. Whereas if you teach a thought process, it can lead to a topic and you can disagree with it, but if you teach a topic, there's an immediate right or wrong. So I, I, don't, I don't know how I'm trying to say this. I don't know the $10 way of saying it, but like, <laughs> like is the solution teaching thought, not topic? Yeah, no, I actually, I don't think that's right. Um, in part because some topics I think are clearly just open, right? So if we were to discuss, I have very strong views about what we should be doing about health policy and healthcare in the United States, but I also think it's just really clearly an open question, right? Um, that it's an open policy question. How we should structure our tax code is an open policy question. Like there are all sorts of open questions where even if you have strong views, it, it's, there's no right answer that is the only defensible right answer. 
And then there are others where there's this question, right, about if there's only one defensible right answer or not. The other thing is, like, I'm super curious what your mom would have done in the block example. Um, so this is something where the fact that Sarah Kaleha uh, is a um, elementary school teacher was really important because my experience is all with eighth graders on up. I never would have thought of doing what Elena did. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's so insightful. But then, of course, there is this problem that she is cutting it off, right? Um, so, you know, that's a process thing in some ways, right? Th this was choice time. The whole idea behind what happens in this first grade classroom is that students are choosing what, to, what materials to use and how to use them, and they're, and they're being creative. And as Elena said, normally she allows them to work out disagreements themselves because that is part of the process, right? But here the process got into trouble, at least from Elena's perspective. Okay, thank you. Thank sure. You. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get somewhere in just a second, but, okay. but bear with me. So I'll say this as a former high school teacher for five years and as a political scientist who believes in civic engagement and, and, and training good citizens. Perhaps one way to get out of this dilemma of what should be done in the schools is to not do it at all. In other words, you mentioned earlier that the students are in an environment that they don't have any choice to be in, so they're trapped. And since they're trapped, potentially us bringing in the outside world and these political issues into the system is not fair to begin with. So we shouldn't be talking about how do we do it better or how do we do it more fairly. Potentially, we shouldn't be doing it at all. And would you support pulling civic engagement, civic dialogue and discussion out of the schools and simply have the schools be places where they're learning these topics, but we don't bring the political world into it as much? For example, if it were a hospital, we wouldn't walk through a hospital putting up signs about freedom or signs about First Amendment or anything else. It's a hospital. We let a hospital do its business. Maybe we should let a school do its business and keep the discussion separate because, again, the students are there having no choice to be there. And we should think about other ways to democratize individuals, not necessarily in the schools. And I know that sounds a little weird, but... Especially for political but, but scientists. I think, I, think it's, I think it's one possible solution, in other words, to the dilemma is quit doing it and we quit sort of being the parents who think our students should be modeling this behavior and we want our students to talk about it and things like that. All right, okay, so I totally disagree and let me tell you why. Um, uh, I, said, I said, give me a minute, yeah, we'll yeah, get yeah. there. <laughs> I didn't expect agreement. Um, so, so one thing is that most of the cases that came up here, right, were not actually the teacher's choice to introduce them. So, the, so Danielle and Colin are talking about their support for Trump. Other kids are talking about their support, presumably, for Hillary. Teresa, in her friendship or something, you know, has talked about the fact that her cousin is undocumented. All of this is coming into the school without the teachers, you know, initiating any of it or inviting it. The kids building the block wall, right? Last week they were making a castle out of blocks, or you know, they were seeing how high they could pile them up before crashing them down, right? Now this week they made a wall. So partly is it is impossible to close the school off from the broader civil society. That's what I meant by educating in a democracy, right? is that schools are embedded within democracies, not only because you have democratically related citizens trying to make decisions about schools and through schools, but also because kids, as members of a democracy, are bringing in their own political experiences and knowledge and viewpoints. I also think uh, you know, that it is really important, say, whether or not they're having a direct political conversation, after, you know, certainly after President Trump was elected, in many cities after there has been an ICE raid, right, kids are incredibly scared. And for no other reason than helping them feel more centered and calm and hence able to learn. If all you cared about was academic achievement, it would still be important to address what had happened in the community and help them feel as if they could be safe in school. 
So that's one set of things, right, is that the, school, that the greater political surround imposes itself on the school even if the school wanted to wall itself off. But the second piece is that if we're not engaging in proactive civic education, then we are going to have terrible, terrible citizens, right? Just like if we don't engage in math education, we are going to have terrible mathematicians. And if we stop doing lab science, we're going to have terrible or non-existent scientists, right? But one of the differences about civic education from something even like lab science is that if you don't do lab science in a school, most likely kids just won't be grow up and become lab scientists, right? Some may try to become lab scientists and may be terrible at it, but most will simply find their way into some other profession, right? But for citizenship, we all find our ways, whether or not it's legal citizenship, right? As people living in a place, we have certain rights and responsibilities. And so we all have civic roles. We all have civic rights and responsibilities, whether or not we choose them. And we are dependent on others to exercise those rights and responsibilities appropriately too. And it is bizarre beyond belief, not that I'm saying that you're bizarre, because I know in part you were posing this for a, you know, as a, um, yeah, uh, so it's really bizarre to think that somehow citizens are going to spring, right, fully formed at age 18 out of the Zeus's head of a school that never, ever, ever engages in civic education. Furthermore, you're getting me on my soapbox. Uh, so, further, uh, so furthermore, one of the really weird things is that even in schools that do commit themselves to civic education, they tend to commit themselves by teaching kids about how others are citizens, right? They learn about how government works or even how civil society works. So they learn about Dolores Huerta or whatever, right? They learn about other people who may be great people doing good things, but in math, we do not have kids only learn about other mathematicians, right? We have them do math. And in English, yes, they learn about other writers, but then we have them write, and we have them practice writing, and we have them practice, they do lab science, or they do, right? They do the thing that we are trying to have them learn. And so we should be having them do citizenship if we want them to learn citizenship. Because otherwise, it would be this very weird thing that is the only thing that one could learn by learning about others doing it, whereas everything else in life, playing baseball, reading, whatever, we learn through doing the thing, magically, citizenship, we can just like read about others. And that's just not true, right? So we have to have kids doing citizenship in schools, as even if we could somehow you know, close the school off from the surrounding society. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have it in the middle. I don't know, Mohammed, if you're able to get to him. Or, you said the ethical dilemma that we face in our education system is whether to pre uh, prepare or protect our children from the outside world. This is more of a statement. Um, I believe that we should be prepared for the outside world because we are the only I mean, I hope I made it clear in this case that I'm really not no, trying to hate on you. <laughs>
um, and they do want to hurt people. And I think they're, um, we need to prepare our children for that. We need to prepare them that, you know, when you do go out on your own, um, there are going to be people out there that do want to cause harm. And that no matter what we, you know, say or do, we can't always protect them. And I just think. So I, so there's one piece that I totally agree with, which is that we do have to prepare kids for the world that they are entering, right? Like, you know, I, as I said, at some point, like when you have infants, clearly you're in total protective nurturing stage. Although that nurturing is also allowing them to reach for, you know, the plastic keys or to, you know, be frustrated because they can't get their oatmeal in their mouths or, you know, whatever it is, right? So there's even pieces of autonomy there. But, you know, we have this ethic of care, right, at really young. And as I said, I think you have to prepare young people to then face the world and its challenges, including its threats, by the time they leave high school. And pr I think pretty early in high school, in part because we have a shocking number of people who do not make it through high school, right, who leave earlier than that. Where I am going to push back some is this question, and this is where I, I feel this real tension, right, of as we think about threat and who is threatening and how we perceive them as threatening, it may be that in a certain moment in time, there is an extant threat, right, of one person or group uh, or nation or whatever against another. And yet what you hope, right, what we all want is to get to a place where that threat does not exist, right, where we can live in peace and comedy and equality with one another. So part of what I think we wrestle with is how much do we prepare young people to see what we currently perceive as being threats, as threats, and to what extent, and how can we educate them somehow to get beyond that even before it is fully safe to do so, right? Because part of changing ourselves is sort of getting ahead of ourselves, right? And so, say, as a flip um, of, you know, how you potentially are thinking about threats, I think about, say, um, when I taught uh, in both Atlanta and Boston, most of my students were low-income kids of color. And one of the things that um, the, my students' parents or aunts or grandparents or whoever they were living with had to figure out was when to have, especially for, um, say, African-American families, there's now, you know, because of Black Lives Matter and others, there's this publicly known thing about the talk, right? You know, in this discussion about the ways in which people, let's say, uh, members of the police force may be threats to you even when you do not believe you are posing any threat to them, right? In some ways, clearly, all of us, everybody, including the most avid Black Lives Matter activists out there, wants us to live in a world where that is not the case, right? Where the talk is not necessary and where police officers are not perceived or experienced as being thre threats, especially to young black men. It is also, I think, fairly clearly the case that right now we do not live in that world at least not in all places, right? And so then there's this question, right, about how we move from one world to the other. And part of the reason, say, that I wrote this case the way that I and Sarah and Tony did, and that I'm engaged in writing these normative cases and then discussing them with others, is because this is an exercise for me in saying it cannot always be the others and only the others who we need to change, right? Somehow it also has to be ourselves. So yes, say as somebody who is much, who is clearly, I mean as you figured out, much more on the left than you are, right? I think that police, the way in which police officers are trained and socialized needs to change. But somehow we also have to shift society. Right? It can't only be that they have to change and then everything will be fine. Now, part of how we need to shift society, in my view, is overcoming structural racism, doing all sorts of other things, right? That we are all living in the surround of. But that's where I'm just like, I feel this tension, right? Yes, yes, sorry, go ahead.
point. Mm -hmm. I do realize that. Um, and I wish there was something that I could do to change that. But uh, I really don't feel that I have any tension towards any. I'm not. Yeah, sorry. No, I wasn't saying that you have tension toward other people. I'm saying that there's this tension. I do think that you have a role to play. Just like I think all of us have a role to play in crossing over these divides. Sorry, was there a hand here? Yes. Great. Uh, I don't think we can take people's word that they don't hate um, because uh, we have to evaluate how hateful they are by everything they express and what's the outcome of their attitudes. Um, I think the most prevalent uh, unrecognized form of hatred is this continual obsession with safety, protection, uh, uh, this you know continual fear of others and all that. I think that's quite the most prevalent form of hatred we encounter today. So I'm going to pose another uh, case to you that I don't think we have. No, we don't have it on our website because it's coming out in this book next year, and we wrote the case after. We got the book contract, so we're not allowed to post it. But I'd be happy to send it to you through the Kegley Center as, you know, as an individual thing if you're interested. We wrote a case about um, a, a sort of, it's a fictional case again, but based on Brentwood High School in Suffolk County, Long Island. So some of you may have read, it's been in the New Yorker, in the Atlantic, in New York Magazine, in a bunch of others, Slate, I think. Um, uh, this is a, this is a school in which five kids have been murdered by MS-13 in the last three years. It's a uh, county in which literally dozens of people have been murdered um, by MS-13. Kids are terrified. And at the same time, this high school is engaging in very clearly discriminatory actions against uh, Latinx students uh, that are designed actually to get uh, kids um, out of the school whether or not they have done anything wrong. The reason we fictionalize the case is because for Tatiana Jerome, my uh, student and co-author and me, there was no ethical dilemma in that particular case. It was quite clear that the school should not be engaging in racial profiling and should not be engaging in what is in effect preemptive deportation by having their school resource officers uh, report kids to um, the law enforcement who would then report them to ICE for such charges as walking in the hallway near a suspected gang member, sitting in the cafeteria near a suspected gang member, having the area code for El Salvador written on the front of their notebook, or having devil's horns or horns doodled in the margins of their uh, paper, especially since the mascot for Brentwood High School is the Blue Devils, right? So clearly, so, right, I'm, I'm with you there. That is just ethically indefensible. However, here's the harder case, and this is the case that, again, I'd be happy to send you if you just contact the uh, institute, is a district that actually got rid of school resource officers five years before and replaced them with uh, restorative justice practices. And so they do not have police officers. However, as you may know, the Department of Justice uh, is uh, making available fairly large grants to especially uh, law enforcement to work with community institutions, including often schools, to engage in anti-gang and anti-gang violence initiatives. And there are some communities like Suffolk County, Long Island that are really, really suffering. They have had, I think, I don't quite remember the numbers, I think it's 80,000. No, it can't be that. Maybe it's 8,000. I have to look. I don't want to be off by a factor of 10. They have a lot, a lot, a lot of unaccompanied migrant kids, as well as undocumented families showing up in this particular place and in the schools, and especially a lot of unaccompanied minors. So they have legal status to be there as their case is working their way through. And there are huge dangers. Two of the girls there were murdered with machetes in the woods. Like, it's, it's horrifying. And so in this case, the district has the local law enforcement, the local sheriff's office, having gotten a grant from the Department of Justice saying, we would like to partner with you on anti-gang initiatives. And yet, they have undocumented students in the school who say, if I see police officers or sheriff's deputies in the school, 
I am not going to come, right? Because I worry. I know that the school is safe for me now, and I worry it's not going to be safe for me then. Again, I find this really hard. As I said, I do not write a case study where I know what the answer is. I take this, the sense of safety really seriously, and I take the sense, the commitment to inclusion and a different kind of safety really seriously. It's really important to me that as Plyler v. Doe, the Supreme Court case, says we have an obligation to educate all children who are living here in the United States, no matter what their legal status is. And so, I mean, you know, my guess is that you and I are fairly politically aligned, and I am sympathetic in some ways to your suspicion of who gets seen as a threat and how and why. But I do not think that we should just reject, you know, all senses of threat or safety as being inherently, um, you know, a, a sign of uh, racism or xenophobia or something else. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you might be right. I think we had somebody over here. I just want to say thank you for presentation. And I was just wondering if I could get a photo with you. I need it for extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> After this is over, sure. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I'm assuming you'll tell me when. The, yes, great. Uh, Dr. Levinson, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I agree that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for teachers to teach a set of core viewpoints that aren't politicized. From my perspective, we should be teaching students how to think, not what to think. What are your thoughts on teachers framing the political conversations that arise between the students? I ask this because students are more likely than most to adopt the beliefs of someone such as family members without performing their due diligence. Asking them to try to understand why they believe what they believe will help prepare them to participate in a democracy, which is one of the key roles of education, as was mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think you're absolutely right that having students uh, investigate what they believe and why and how and really interrogate it, and where is the evidence for that, right? And like, what, what are the best counter arguments and, and so forth is really good education in general and civic education in particular. At the same time, I also think that we do want to teach kids what to believe in some cases, right? We want to teach kids to believe in democracy rather than authoritarianism or fascism or totalitarianism. That's a real risk these days, right? Over a quarter of young people right now in the United States do not see democracy as being a particular value. And I think that's a problem, right? Right, so so there, there may be many, many reasons, right, that they do not value democracy. And there may be really good ways to teach them to value democracy that seem very student-centered and very investigatory. All I'm saying is, at the end of it, they better be Democrats rather than fascists. Right? So I really do think that, as teachers, we feel and an obligation to teach certain things that, in fact, we believe people should believe. Um, whether we teach them what Michael Hand calls directively, uh, or if we sort of take an apparently undirective approach, and then magically they end up thinking this, right? But I think, you know, we believe that uh, kids should um, uh, learn to treat men and women equally. Uh, nowadays, if I were teaching, I would probably uh, want to teach them, again, this will in part depend on the school that I was in as to how effectively I could do this, to see beyond a gender binary, right? There are all sorts of things that I may want them to adopt as beliefs about the world. Uh, and I'm not going to just totally open it up, 
And then there are other things, tax policy, even health policy, and so forth, that I think, you know, I'll say, okay, figure out what is the data behind that? Why do you think that? What do the people say on the other side? I might even do that for democracy versus fascism if I'm 100% confident they'll end up at democracy. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's your opinion on, like, school elections, not like ASB, but um, like fake elections with um, Donald Trump and Hillary? Because last year, my school did that, and I saw people who were like friends from first grade completely divided. Uh, have they become friends? Hold on to the microphone for a second. Have they become friends again, or, or did the friendships end? Um, most of them became friends after a while again, but some just ended. Yeah. I mean, so, it's a great question. I think, you know, what happened with your classmates also happened with adults, right? Um, there are adults whose friendships either temporarily or permanently ended. There are families that are still struggling uh, to, um, to get past their political divides or have just decided not to, right? Um, and so in part, this gets back to the protection question, right? Is should you guys be protected from this or should you be helped in this hard work that we're all going through, right? Of learning how and whether to live and work together and embrace one another even in the face of really profound differences. Um, and I think, I mean, as I said when I was on my soapbox here, right, that I think that the best way to prepare good citizens is to have you be citizens and do citizenship, and then ideally to have really uh, well-trained and well-supported teachers who can then help you hurt through the hard parts of citizenship. Because frankly, because citizenship is really hard. You know, it's, in part, it's super boring most of the time, right? Uh, I mean, it's hard to remember that right now because we have this continual soap opera going on, right? But that's part of the problem, right, is that we're distracted by the soap opera, and in the meantime, real policies are being enacted uh, that are actually what is the part that matters. So I think I am, so I am in favor of mock elections. Um, I should say, I was really mixed about it. My first year teaching, was it my first year? A year that I was teaching uh, in Boston, we held a mock election, and at that point, I guess it was 2004, so it wasn't my first year. Um, uh, so it was George Bush running against John Kerry. Uh, and, um, uh, in this school in Boston, we had all we had the, we had the homerooms. We had this whole thing. I designed it. I was like this super rah rah rah. I'm teaching eighth grade civics. We're going to organize into like electoral college. So the small homerooms had like one electoral vote, and the medium homerooms had I don't know, three electoral votes. Then we had the large homerooms with like six electoral votes, whatever. And they all went marching across with their placards. And right, the whole homeroom had like their internal vote, and then all of the electoral like votes went to that. Well, what ended up happening was that every homeroom in the school voted for John Kerry, except for the three homerooms that had sheltered English learners who voted for Bush. Um, I think because he was uh, in favor of immigration reform at the time. And that was horrible because it was such this public divide, right? Already these sheltered English learner classrooms felt sort of split off from the rest of the school and, and like they were on their own. And now they had had, they were forced to march across the stage and say, we support Bush when everybody else supported Kerry. So it's difficult even when it's not the one of the most divisive elections of anybody's lifetime. So it's just really hard and I just have to say, I hope that you have teachers who can help you and your classmates navigate through, and unfortunately, it's just not easy. Hi. Yeah. Hello, um, so my question is. Um, sorry, you next. So we know that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to <laughs> cut okay. him off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, we do have a lot of political discussions going on in the classroom. Like you said, it's, it's inevitable, correct? 
Um, but I've often seen this political discussion spiral in a complete negative direction. It often gets aggressive. It often takes this terrible turn. So do you see any value in teaching students how to communicate their ideas in a way that's not so aggressive, in a sense? Or um, should we moderate any comments made during the class uh, when these topics get brought up? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a terrific book by Diana Hess and Paula McAvoy called The Political Classroom that anybody who is a teacher or preparing to be a teacher or who is working with teachers um, ought to read, um, uh, which ex gives some really great uh, insight into how to help students prepare for and have uh, mutually respectful but hard-hitting discussions about controversial issues. So there are a bunch of things that we can do. And one of the things that they talk about in there is uh, a teacher who shows her uh, class a video of adults having a really bad discussion about a controversial issue, and then discussing all, like naming all of the features that make it bad, right? You know, talking over each other, sort of willfully misunderstanding each other, setting up straw men, using uh, slurs, right? You know, you can sort of go through it, ignoring evidence, da 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 and then that inspires the students to say, oh, well, we can do better than that. And obviously, you can name the reverses of those things and then practice having that. They have examples of rubrics that can be used. So yes, I do think that um, high quality discussion doesn't just happen naturally. It has to be taught, um, you know, as in so many things. But then, yes, it can be taught well. And if it's taught well, and if there are all conversations in the school, including with parents and so forth, about the fact that these things are happening, then when it goes badly, because something will happen, right? Somebody will use a slur. Somebody will, like, something will happen. Then there can be a response of understanding and repair rather than outrage and going to the newspaper and having, you know, the community divided. Uh, but that's only if people are aware that this is really important work going into it, and then they can accept that there are mistakes, just like you can accept when the football team loses the state championship. You may not be happy about it, but you understand that that happens. And similarly, we may not be happy about it, but we should understand that occasionally these discussions will spiral out of control, even when you have the best possible preparation. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, you've challenged me, and I, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of research on this stuff, and I will start out by saying that um, I'll take what you've said, I'm gonna look it up, I'll research it. However, I've, as I've grown up in college, I've come to realize that as noble as professors may appear on the outside and as educated as, as they may be, I cannot take what they say as an absolute. They all have to be challenged. Um, oh, of course. Especially with these diversity classes that I've taken, um, I've seen they're very, they're taught in a way that ends up having people coming out hating white Americans. Um, for example, when you leave out information with regards to Black Lives, the Ma Black Lives Matter movement, which I very much disagree with that movement, um, they neglect certain statistics that show that in the 75 largest counties, perhaps you're familiar with this, um, black Americans commit most of the crimes there, and there have been studies that have been done showing that cops themselves are less likely to, to shoot at black Americans than they are white Americans. And the black on black crime is a lot higher than um, the white on black crime. And so, when, when those factors are left out, or that white Americans were slaves at one point, the white slaves of Barbary, if you Google it, it leaves out a lot of information that it, it just divides people in such a way that it, it makes a lot of minorities hate white, and white Americans. Um, but nonetheless, my main point to you this evening is that um, the highlights of the March 2018 Gallup research um, shows that 61% up from 54% in 2017 say campus climate prevents people from speaking freely and students perceive conservatives as less able to express their views. 
um, the Economic Journal Watch study of the top 40 leading universities in the US, which includes Harvard, shows an 11.5 to 1 ratio of liberal professors outnumbering conservative ones. Um, the history department was a 33.5 to 1 ratio, which means your history um, cannot be seen as accurate. And from my experience, um, with some of the textbooks that, are, that I've read in this campus, um, they have liberally biased sources like the New York Times, the PBS, Public Broadcasting Station, and CNN, which the Pew Researcher identifies as liberally biased. So everything that you read and watch, it needs to be challenged. And um, it should be noted that indoctrination works. If it did not, then why do authoritarian regimes control what is taught in their schools? And a liberally biased academia and administration that gets to decide what is considered an undemocratic ideology, speech, behavior, and or microaggression will not be as willing to protect the rights of an opposing ideology because those views will be offensive to them. Harvard professor and former Obama administrator Cass Sunstein pointed out that whenever a group becomes ideologically homogenous, it tends to drift farther and farther in that direction and becomes hostile to outsiders. Now, some of the few hard to detect conservative faculty on this campus that I've spoken with have told me that they are not comfortable expressing their views and some conservative students on this campus recently have had their safety at risk because of expressing their views, but they don't, they're not reporting it because um, especially schools in general, including this one, have shown a deportment that they, it seems as though they don't, they don't care. Okay, so, so let me take a couple of those things. Okay. I, I can't take all of them. Um, I have to work on making my arguments more concise, so I'm working <laughs> on it. And it's, it's what I tell my students when they write papers all the time. Less is more, less is more. It's true for the five-page paper. Very it's true. true. And it's true for the doctoral dissertation. Um, so, uh, so very briefly on the issue of Black Lives Matter, um, I think that... Uh, it's important, I mean, this obviously isn't something that we can sort through here. I, I think that there are a few things that when one talks about black on black crime, um, it's important to recognize that most crime happens on, uh, among people who live near each other and interact with one another and because of highly segregated um, cities in the United States, that ends up being that there's black on black crime and there's white on white crime, uh, right? So this is about geographic segregation as a, uh, that has sort of geographic racial segregation that plays itself out in patterns rather than um, something about, say, black criminal attitudes or mindsets. And I also think that, yeah, I mean, I know the Roland Fryer study that you were talking about, that, yeah. which, which mm -hmm. looked at the Texas uh, data uh, fascinatingly and interestingly. Um, I haven't followed the discussion of his study since then. I do, th you know, as you can tell, um, I both have a somewhat different interpretation of the data and a different interpretation of the movement insofar as I interpret the Black Lives Matter movement as inherently being a movement about the assertion that we should value black lives as we value other lives. Um, but you know, getting into the details of that and whether that's the right interpretation and so forth would take us far beyond this talk. I think though that part of what I, is important here is this question of how do we talk to one another, right? And what would that conversation and what should that conversation, and this gets us sort of to the end part of what you were saying, look like in the classroom, right? And what kinds of discourse should be allowed when, if ever, should students feel shame, right? For, or feel or be shamed for saying certain things in the classroom. And again, I've been pretty clear that I think that there are some things that students should learn and that, that there are other things hopefully a wider body of things that students should legitimately discuss. It is really hard when you have students who tend to agree with one another and, and tend to agree with a faculty member, if then you, to be a dissenting voice. And one of the things that I remind my overwhelmingly 
liberal students at the Harvard Graduate School of Education with their obviously strongly lefty, you know, professor at the helm is to remember the history of the eugenics movement at Harvard. So Harvard University was one of the centers of the movement in the early 20th century to promote eugenics as a progressive movement. It was a progressive political movement to try to, say, to improve society, strengthen our human stock, and improve the lives of people who were undergoing forced sterilization on the grounds that they were deemed to be too unfit to be good parents or good family members. And this had the strongest scientific backing of some of the most reputable scientists in the country. So when you talk about the risks of an ideological consensus, I think you are right, even though I think you and I have pretty opposite actual political views. And one of the things that we need to do is figure out how to create spaces for dissenting views, and then figure out, though, there have to be some boundaries around those, but I don't know what those boundaries are, right? And that's where I think we get stuck. Do we need to end here? So thank you. <laughs>Thanks, everybody, again, for coming. And uh, again, if you want to check out one of Dr. Levinson's books, um, there's a table right out in the lobby. Uh, so feel free to do that and can stay in chat for a while. Thank you.